This week we're going to be discussing ancient Chinese and Indian mathematics. It is impossible to cover within such a short period of time some of the greatest achievements of these two very rich cultures. So I encourage you to do more reading and in this in these lectures we will simply be highlighting some of the works, some of the authors and some of the mathematical achievements that have been made by mathematicians from these countries. Let's start with ancient Chinese mathematics. First of all, um, here are some ancient dynasties of China and some of the developments that have taken place during those periods of time. So back in minus 17 to 1100 BC, we have Shang Dynasty, and this is where we're finding artifacts such as writing on oracle bones and silk weaving is already invented. Zhu Dynasty coming up next and lasting for a long time, we see the dissolution into feudal states and various developments such as iron casting, irrigation, and intellectual development under Confucius that we, of course, still know to be very powerful today. Qing Dynasty did not last very long, but this is when China was unified, and as a result, a system of law and tax was developed and implemented, which also meant that there was standardization in writing and weights and measurements, which of course then had to be supported by various mathematical um, formulas, for example. The next dynasty, again, Han Dynasty, is when the trade routes to India and Persia were established, the paper was invented, and this is when we begin to find various accounts of actual mathematical works. Let's take a look at some of the mathematical works that we actually have copies of today. The first one we're going to talk about is the Book of Numbers and Computation, written due to the early Han Dynasty, so somewhere between minus 200 BC, and uncovered in 1983. It is extensive. It's 200 strips of bamboo written in ink, 180 of which are intact and fully legible. It contains 69 mathematical problems from a variety of sources in terms of context, so geometry, algebra, and so on. Each problem, and this is going to be true of the Chinese approach to mathematics throughout, it has a question, an answer, followed by a method or justification or algorithm how the answer was obtained from the question itself. And the topics are a great variety across the mathematical contents, including volumes of three-dimensional shapes. The next source of ancient Chinese mathematics that we have is Arithmetical Classic of Naman. Naman is... You can think of that as like an L-shaped construction tool, but it's really something that you place on a sundial to cast a shadow and actually tell you the time. The original book dates from the Zhu dynasty, but it's reached its final form, having been sort of edited and copied and imp um, improved by people in the Han dynasty, so minus 200 years. It is a collection of 246 problems, and again, in the same kind of layout of question, answer, and then algorithm or justification. This book contains one of the first recorded proofs of the Gugu theorem, or what we know as Pythagorean theorem. Of course, they don't call it Pythagorean theorem. Um, the Gugu comes from the names of the sides that the writer actually gives to the right angle triangle. So the horizontal side, the horizontal hook, is called the Gu, and the vertical side, or a leg, is called Gu. I'm not going to be able to pronounce it with any kind of distinction between them, but you get the point. The hypotenuse or the bowstring is called Jian, and so overall the Gu Gu is really a hook and the leg. Okay. Um, now the proof is geometric, and so relies on a diagram as we will see in class. But and this is really what also caused some of the um, criticism, unfounded criticism of the depth and richness of some of the Chinese mathematics. They developed a very different approach to mathematical thought through this question-answer justification that is very different from Euclid. And the Eurocentric point of view is to say, well, they're not playing by the Euclidean rules and therefore this is not quite as rigorous of mathematics approach. Just because it's different doesn't mean it's less rigorous or less good. So as we will shortly see, the Chinese sources present some of the most rich mathematics in, uh, amongst the cultures, and some of them still survive to this day in their original form. 
The book, this book itself, has been expanded by commentators coming much later. One of the most prolific ones is Liu Hui, who has commented on a variety of ancient sources, so has rewritten the proofs, has clarified the proofs, and also provided his own commentary to further deepen the presentation of these results. The arithmetical classic of Naaman is written in the shape of a dialogue between the Duke of Zhu and Shan Gao, his astronomer, and you can read through some of the made-up conversations they've had just to see um, the sort of some of the interplay within the text. The reply that Zhang Gao provides to the question, where do numbers come from, um, is also indicative of the Chinese approach, the ancient Chinese approach to mathematics. He says, the patterns for, this num for these numbers come from the circle and the square. The circle comes from the square, the square comes from the tri-square, which again is the L-shaped construction type tool, and the tri-square comes from the fact that nine nines are 81. Nine nines is just a multiplication table of, you know, up to nine by nine. This really gets at the um, root of how the ancient sources portray mathematics with this idea of distinguishing categories the circle, the square, the tri-square, the numbers, in order to unite them, in order to show what is common to all of these things and finding common properties. The most extensive book of um, ancient Chinese mathematics that we have is so-called Nine Chapters on the Mathematical Art. The original book dates to approximately minus 300 to 179 AD, but the actual existing copies all stem from Liu Hui's commentary um, at around 200 and year 263. It is again a collection of question-answer algorithm problems, but this time around, this idea of distinguishing categories is taken further because the book as the name suggests, is compiled into nine quite distinct chapters. So here are the chapters and um, a short description of what happens within each chapter. Uh, we have in the first chapter land surveying, arithmetical operations, um, various small um, geometrical results, and an approximation of pi being equal to 3. Next, we have millet and rice, which is actually percentages and proportions, which is likely motivated from the fact that the measuring systems had to be standardized. And so this originally contained a table which converted weights of varied grains to different kinds of measurement um, standards. Then we have distribution by progression, taxes, arithmetic, and geometric progressions. Diminishing breaths, which is finding um, sides of figures with single sides known. Um, so you can think of like either similar triangles or something like this, but also examples of squares and cube roots. So we already see some very deep mathematics being developed here. The next one, consultation of engineering works, solid figures and their volumes, important taxation, so general distribution of taxes. Chapter 7 contains method of false position that was not actually found in Europe until the 13th century. So, you know, almost a, like a millennia later. And in chapter 8, where we have solving systems of equations, this contains methods that are identical to Gaussian illumination method. Now, this, of course, is much before Gauss that live in 1700, born in 1777. So there's no way that this has been influenced by any kind of European, um, European heritage there. And then finally, the right angles, properties of right angles, and the Pythagoras theorem. Again, not called Pythagoras in the book. So why the chapters? Well, Liu Hui actually explains it in his own preface. He talks about the yin and yang and how he views the mathematical methods in this breaking apart form. The categories under which the matters fall extend each other when compared so that each benefits from the comparison. So even though the branches are separate, they come from the same root. And one may know that they each show a separate tip of the same tree, right? Everything benefits from comparison. 
the distinguishing categories in order to unite the categories is a really key theme in these books. There was a fascination with numbers and mathematical patterns in ancient China. Different numbers were believed to have different cosmic significance, and in particular, magic squares were thought to be of great spiritual and religious significance. So this particular one is called a low shoe square of order three, three by three, where every column, every row, and every diagonal adds to 15. That's quite a cosmic coincidence, don't you think? Check all of the diagonals and see that that is, in fact, the case. The other things that we see are bigger magic squares, as well, of course, as probably familiar to all of us, the Chinese zodiac, a repeating cycle of the 12 years, where every year um, gets its own animal. There are other patterns that are being really thought about within this particular type of thing. And you can find the magic squares in almost all of them. We also see Pascal's triangle appear in ancient Chinese works. So a familiar one, 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 two, one, one, three, three, one for the binomial distribution and so on. So this shouldn't be called Pascal's triangle at all. Pascal has not lived for years and years and years after these already appeared in Chinese texts and were studied for the pattern of numbers that they are. Some of the other great advances, again, include solving of the systems of linear equations with the method as similar as it can possibly be to Gaussian elimination, leaving roots unevaluated, resulting in more exact solutions. So this is your, you know, square root of two versus the decimal expansion of it. The Chinese were not afraid of the irrationality or leaving the number as a more abstract understanding of what it is. They did approximate pi using the method of exhaustion, but now with the 192 gone, which made it correct up to five decimal places, we see early form of calculus resulting from this method of exhaustion idea of breaking things into smaller and smaller pieces, repeated root approximations resulting from that, which is similar to Newton's method, that something that we now know as Newton's method. And finally, the Chinese remainder theorem that at least kept its origin as in its name. While the nine chapters themselves contain solutions to quadratic and cubic equations, the methods that were laid in there were later generalized to higher roots and any degree polynomials. This work of Jia Jian was then further improved by Ken Jiashu. I am probably butchering my names and I apologize profusely. If someone can teach me how to properly pronounce them, I will be eternally grateful. Um, he, around year 1200, produced an iterative method designed to solve polynomial equations to any degree of precision, a highly non-trivial task. Most of the proofs throughout the ancient Chinese sources are presented in both algebraic and geometric constructions, thinking back to like the yin and the yang, seeing things through different representations and gaining richer and deeper understanding because of it. And once again, the Chinese remained a theorem that dates back to 3rd century, was motivated by the development of calendar and therefore resulted in the development of modular arithmetic and modular equations. Let's take a look at one of the methods to solve a type of modular equation that is presented in one of these sources. Let's take a look here at King's method of technique of finding 1, which is to solve equation of the form px equals 1 mod m, where p and m are relatively prime. Now, of course, I'm writing this in the modern notation, and that is not how it appeared in the um, ancient Chinese text, but bear with me here. What we will do is we will actually consider an example. So let's try to solve the equation. 65x is equal to 1 mod 83 using this method. Now, first of all, before we can apply it, we have to make sure that the condition holds. So the numbers 65 and 83 are indeed relatively prime, which means that we can proceed by continuing with this method. The method consists of, first of all, placing the given numbers into a square. So I'm going to start with a square, and in the left corners, I'm going to place 1 and 0. This is how the method always starts. And in the right corners, I'm going to place the numbers 65 and 83 in that order. So the first number goes on top, 
the second number goes on the bottom. And now I'm going to have to follow through with the procedure to transform this square into another square by following through some of the steps. So let me draw the second square here. And the first thing we're going to do is actually take a look at the second column, as you might call it, right? We're going to find the larger number of these two. The larger one is 83, of course. Now we're going to divide 83 by 65. So we've picked the, the larger number and we're going to divide it by the smaller number. Again, using the modern notation, I can write that 83 is 1 times 65 plus 18. And so what we actually do next, after we've performed the division, we're going to replace that bigger number by the remainder of the division. So here now, I will have 18 and 65 persists. Next, I'm going to have to adjust my left column to something potentially different. So what we're going to do here is we're going to multiply, and this is a little bit of a mouthful, we're going to multiply quotient by smaller co-number. So these guys are going to be called numbers, and their corresponding left-hand sides are going to be called co-numbers. So this is the smaller of these two. So we're going to multiply the quotient of the division by the smaller corresponding number and add the result to the larger corresponding number. So I take my quotient, which is 1, I multiply it by the smaller co-number, because 65 is less than 83. 1 times 1 is 1, and I'm going to add that to the bigger number. So this becomes 1, and this stays as 1. And then I repeat the exact same process again. So let's go through one more step, and then we can see if, or I'll let you carry out the other steps. So let's go through this again. We're going to look at these two numbers, and we're going to pick the larger one. In this case, it's 65. Here, then, I have to divide 65 by 18. So again, in modern notation, that means I'm going to have 18 goes into 65 three times with the remainder of 11. Okay, so the two numbers, the smaller one will stay behind, but the bigger one that I divided into the smaller one will get replaced by the remainder. So 11 here. And then again, I'm going to have to adjust my first column here. I'm going to consider the smaller of the co numbers. So between these two guys, 18 is the smaller. So I'm going to take a look at 1. I'm going to multiply it by the quotient, which is 3. And I'm going to add the result to the other number. So 1 times 3 is 3, plus 1 is 4. So this number gets replaced by 4. One more time. Maybe I'll do this one more time before I let it go. So again, we're going to take a look at the other two numbers, pick the largest one. So that's the second row here. That means that I need to divide 18 by 11. So I am going to have 18 is 1 times 11 plus 7. And again, that means that I am keeping my 11 here, but I'm replacing 18 by the remainder of the division, which is 7. And then I'm going to replace this column or replace some numbers in this column by following it through the exact same algorithm, right? So I'm going to take the smaller of these two numbers or the body of the smaller of these two numbers, which is 4, multiplied by the quotient, which is 1, and add that to the other number. 4 times 1 is 4 plus 1 is 5. So my next square is this. And we're going to carry on until we get number one in the top right. That's why it's called the technique of finding one. We're going to follow through with this until we get one in this corner here. Try it out for yourself. And so pause the video, try it out, and then come back to see if you get the same squares as I do. So these are my other three squares. And you notice that now I get one in the right top corner which means I am done. 
what I actually am looking for, of course, is a solution to this equation. So excellent. We continue this until we get one. What's the solution? Well, the solution is its co-number. So 23 is actually my x. And we can check that, of course. 65 times 23 will, in fact, be 1 mod 83. The technique of finding 1 is really a technique of writing 1 as a combination of the original two numbers, 65 and 83. And following through these squares, we can see that 1 is 23 times 65 minus 18 times 83. And this also makes it very clear why 23 is indeed a solution to this equation. If I take this equation mod 83, the second term will go away, and I get that 65 times my x, or 23, is indeed equal to 1. What does this remind you of? And in fact, what is this entire process remind you of? Is there another algorithm that we know better than this, that is more familiar to us, that seems to follow through the exact same steps of dividing the two numbers and replacing the larger by the remainder and then doing the same thing over and over and over again? Think about this for a second. And I hope that you can remember that this is more or less essentially what we call Euclidean algorithm. Again, Euclid wasn't the only person who came up with it, yet it inherits its name. Think about the similarities and the differences. Think about distinguishing categories in order to unite categories. Distinguishing approaches in order to see what they have in common.